Hi everyone. Welcome to this month's community call. We are very happy that you could all join us today. It will be the last community call for this year. My name is Marian and I will be your host for today's call. So before we start, let's have a quick look at the agenda. So first we'll give an update from our side. Um, Riken will talk about updates we've been working on on the console. Then Alexis will take us through things we're working on in the server team. Then next up is Tiru. So the community has been asking us to release like a product roadmap or milestones so that you can all see what we're working on. And we've been doing this and Tiru will share this later in the call. And Tanmay will do some feature demos. Among others, he will talk about um, the action feature um, doing a console demo. Um, well, if you have questions, you can just ask in the chat and the presenters will take them up and answer when they're done with their presentations. Next up, we have again a community demo. I'm really excited about this. So Gordon will talk about um, how they deployed Lineup Ninja on AWS using Fargate and RDS. And so usually we'll also have a um, part on contributing to Hasura and we will continue with this in the next call because all our time will be used because we have so many features and demos to show you. So I think we can get started. Rikin, are you ready? Mm, yes, I should start. Uh, just give me a second to share my screen. Sure. I hope it's visible now. Yes. Uh, okay, I'm just going to start off. So recently, the server had added support for adding computed fields for your tables. Uh, so what are computed fields? Computed fields are basically virtual values or objects that you can query along with your table columns. And uh, they're not persisted onto your database, but you can just query them through GraphQL. So I'll quickly take uh, you through an example. Uh, so here I have a simple author table, which you can see has an ID, a first name, and a last name. So again, we can go to GraphQL and probably just query for the data. And as you can see, uh, we have a couple of entries which we got returned. Now say we want to query for another field which is derived from the values of the particular table, sorry, of a particular row. So what we could do is add something called a computed field. A computed field is basically a function which will get executed whenever you query for it and return uh, the value in, as, as a part of the response. So for example, we can first create a function. I have a simple function here, which I will just quickly copy and paste. So I can come to the raw SQL page. I can create this function. So this is a simple function, which as you can see, uh, accepts the row, a row of the other table and returns basically the first name concatenated with the last name and hence the, basically the full name. So I could just create this uh, function and then I could head back to the author table, go to the modify tab, create a virtual, sorry, a computed field called full name and just use the function I just created. and save so now if you if you head back to graphical and wait for the schema to load we see that we have a new field here called full name which we can query along with the columns of the table and as you can see we get the first name and last name concatenated and uh, yes so the cool thing the other cool thing about using uh, uh, computed fields is that the functions can also accept uh, Another other parameters. Say, for example, I would just add a, a argument called title, which will be of type text. I'm going to call this new function or the full name title, and I'm just going to append the title to the full name. 
uh, I can head back to Wi-Fi, add a new computed field called full name title, for example, and uh, So now as we go to graphical, you can see that full name title accepts an argument called title, which I could pass, uh, say for example, something, say let's call it doctor. And now when we query, you see that the doctor got appended to the full name. So yes, the computer fields are basically ways to extend your GraphQL schema by executing custom functions, which can use the data of a row to give you, you know, any other derived results that you may want. So this is one, this is a new way we've added of using Postgres functions in Hasura. As you people might be aware, you could always track custom functions, which you, uh, and this, you know, query them to over GraphQL API. I'll, might as well give us quick demo of that, considering we are in the space of Postgres functions. So I could go to the data tab, we come to SQL, create a function. So this example here is a, of a search kind of a use case where I accept a search parameter as text and I basically query over all the fields to make sure and to just check if it matches with any field. So I can run this, create this uh, function and you can see it should show up as a untracked custom function. I can go ahead and track it. And now if you come to graphical, we should be able to search others by passing a parameter. Say I'll search for John, for example, and I can fetch the first name, full name, and the last name. So as you see, the search author returns only the values, um, only the result which has uh, the search term John in it. And we, yeah, I could basically, if I had searched for Doe, I would have gone John Doe and Jane Doe. So these are two ways you could use Postgres functions to extend your GraphQL schema and adding any business logic uh, to your GraphQL schema. Uh, um, yeah, that's pretty much it from my side. I'll take any questions if there are any. I think the questions are being answered in the chat, so I think it's fine. All right, great, perfect. Thank you so much for the demo, Rikin. All right, thank you. Um, Alexis, do you want to go next? Hi. Oh, geez. So as it happens, where I am, some people upstairs have just started. Alexis? Uh, yeah, if somebody else could go. Okay, perfect. Right you now, know, that would be great. Right? I'll try and figure out what to do about the noise. Sure, no problem. Tiro? Yeah, I can, I can go next. Perfect. Uh, okay, hope, hope the screen is visible. Yes, it is. Right, so a lot of community people have been asking us like what's on our roadmap, what are we gonna be doing in the next uh, few weeks to save uh, two or three months. So we have released our public roadmap. So this is uh, under the projects uh, uh, feature here in GitHub. So it's the first project <laughs> and this, this is basically what it's looking like. We have categorized uh, most of our features into four big broad categories. And those are authorization, GraphQL, uh, console and CLI. So these are like the four broad components as uh, all of you might be knowing. So let, let me just go through each one of these and uh, we'll have a, some demo, which I'll show in a bit uh, of one of those features. So starting with authorization, there have been a lot of discussion and a lot of use cases where people want to use multiple rules simultaneously uh, with one query. And this is something that we're going to be taking up 
uh, pretty soon. Like as soon as uh, like it's in the design phase and we'll start writing code for this uh, in a couple of days or weeks or a week. And to just show you what that means, we have this page in the docs uh, under uh, roles and you will see a uh, you'll see a way to model roles, which is hierarchical. And you can see that a user belongs to a member and member can be of type so and so. Currently, what we tell you, uh, and this kind of solves many use cases, most of the use cases, is that you can flatten these out and create flat rules for each one of these and use them with Hasura. So that's the current way. But moving forward, you'll have the flexibility to do anything, including either flat roles or uh, hierarchical tree like roles. So that's uh, the big thing in authorization. And along with that, we have few more add ons which kind of uh, hook on the same concept. And this is, I'm just going to open that here. This is also very interesting, which is allow defining multiple permission tuples for a given role. I mean, this is very, quite specific, but in short, what you can do is for each table for each role, you can specify multiple rules. Uh, so to go back to the previous feature that I talked about, you could think of these as separate roles being executed uh, together and they also grouped in the same role. So two rules, different kind of parameters, so on and so forth, uh, but just one role. So it's very similar to uh, having multiple roles. And finally, the third, item here is uh, this thing which is quite new which is kind of expanding on the exist operator uh, i hope uh, many of you know about the exist operator which was added a couple of months back but it is one of the most powerful features for writing your authorization rules and whatnot exist basically means that you can refer to any table uh, and start using the same uh, kind of operators on those tables without you having to have had made relationships to them. So to kind of nest, kind of have a hierarchical uh, data or nested or having your rules coming from some nested uh, data, you had to have relationships before, but with exists, you can just do it with arbitrary tables. And we are planning to add few other operators as well, which would kind of help you model your uh, authorization, authorization rules to pretty much cover all the cases, right? Okay, so that was authorization. I'll talk about uh, I'll talk about the console next. Let's leave the big gun for the end. So in, in console, there are a lot of small small queries, a lot of issues and feature add-ons. In the end, the end goal is to make console very suitable for content management, and there are these kind of issues. Uh, widgets for content types so you can have a uh, time picker for date json editor for json week type of columns uh, and there are other kind of ui improvements that will just make the console experience very nice as well as adding new features that you can do on the console itself so all of these uh, you can check out the, uh, the issues here and the third uh, thing is the cli and cli is also going through a major uh, uh, feature improvement or a revamp of sorts. And that would allow you to have this first card here, which is about metadata and migration workflows much, much easier. So the basic uh, fundamental thing that we have removed is having different type of uh, metadata queries uh, with the user action. So what we'll, uh, the end game here is basically that no matter how many actions you perform, there's just going to be one file, just the metadata file. And that is the only thing that is persisted on your local system. So you can, uh, you, so it's very easy for you to like collaborate, to pull, put pull request, see the diff and so on. So th this is a whole big uh, change in the workflow. And this would make, uh, uh, this would make things like a collaboration as well as moving from staging to prod and so on much easier. So as soon as we are done with these features, we'll be launching a lot of blog posts around these uh, best practices and workflows. Uh, the, sec the second thing here is scaffolds. I think there were some uh, uh, people leaked the news about scaffolds in uh, the Discord community itself, uh, but it's going to be released pretty soon. So it's basically 
uh, pay for you to do boilerplate generation and code generation with the upcoming actions feature. And uh, I will not talk about this much because we have something lined up uh, later in this call. Uh, so moving on, the third thing is uh, local dev. So we have this new feature called Hasura Logs, which is going to be able to pipe in logs from any uh, source, including Hasura GraphQL Engine, of course, and also maybe your remote schemas, your event triggers, uh, or your action handlers, and so on. And you'll be able to see that together, uh, hot reloaded and whatnot, grouped by request IDs and so on uh, in your local terminal. So that's another thing CLI would be able to do. Uh, right, so that's CLI. So let's uh, move to the main meat of the things that we're doing here. Uh, so the first thing is this thing that started, uh, that started the whole actions feature, which is if you could have three event triggers. So yes, this is the top of our priority right now. And uh, the current state is that we are handling uh, support for Postgres handlers uh, like PLV8 or your standard PLP SQL and so on. So that is being done right now. And we are also extending it to queries. So you can have like custom types for your uh, queries as well. So you can maybe wrap a REST endpoint or uh, wrap any kind of a query. You can just ex extend the query type as well if you wanted. So this was actions, but along with actions, we thought, hey, since you're now going to be doing a lot of business logic at the back end, you would also probably want to have transactions uh, in the back end side using GraphQL as the interface. So this is a crazy feature, I would say, <laughs> uh, which is being worked on. And this is, it's already functional. Uh, so yeah, we'll check this out. I don't know why. Tiru, sorry, um, um, Rakesh will be doing a demo for this, so that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, right. Was there a question? No, I think you can go on. So sorry, I, I I'm just seeing that my inter internet connection was unstable for a bit. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I was at this card, which is that which I, I just repeat myself. Uh, so actions, you would be doing a lot of business logic on the back end. So we thought of also giving you a transactional interface so that you can uh, do multiple mutations and reads, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, in one transaction itself. So it's atomic and whatnot. And this is also something which you can try out uh, today as well with this draft PR. Uh, this, this is a very new thing. So uh, you're just fine tuning the experience and fine tuning all the bugs and so on. So this would really power your actions, uh, use cases, and in general, solve the transaction transactionality problem with GraphQL and over HTTP and whatnot. So this was about actions. I'll move on to the next things on the plate which is going to be adding permissions for remote schemas. Uh, so remote schema, as you know, uh, you have to implement permissions on the remote schema itself. You can add a, a, an authorization header and whatnot to uh, make sure that your clients communicate, your clients are actually authorized to make those uh, uh, requests. But inside there is the role-based stuff and so on that you would have to implement yourself. But with this permissions, uh, 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 bit that you're working on, you'd be able to do something similar to what you do with tables. You'll be able to select the fields that you want to show to particular roles. And you would also be able to preset values uh, for input fields that you might have. So that's permissions for remote schemas. And in the same spirit uh, of remote schemas, what we have also this PR, heterogeneous execution, which is basically you're going to be able to mix Hasura fields and remote schema fields in the same query. If, if any of you have tried that out today, you would see a validation error that you cannot mix Hasura queries with uh, remote queries. So that restriction will be removed. So you can, uh, you can basically do both things. And yes, this obviously leads to uh, remote joins where you can also create relationships across your tables and your remote fields and uh, uh, query them together. And all of these are available in preview, available as draft. 
so you can check them out yourself or if you have any questions you can ask that in discord and whatnot and we'll be able to give you a build or solve your use case uh, with these features finally uh, we come to this last card which is kind of a bonus feature that uh, uh, we have been working on on the side that not many people know about it's called uh, scheduled triggers so let me just open that up Hmm. One second. Can you all still hear me all right? Because I think my internet is slightly slow. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, right, so schedule triggers, let's get onto it. What is it about? So it's available in this uh, PR app, P triple five. So yeah, if you go to the events tab, you would see this familiar event triggers page, but you will now see a new thing called schedule triggers here. And as the name suggests, now you can basically set some kind of a job scheduling or some kind of a one-off, send this, make this event at this, time or basically schedule uh, schedule custom events uh, based on uh, based on time and hasura will make sure again with at least once and reliable guarantee reliable delivery that your, uh, your triggers will be sent uh, so very similar to event triggers except uh, it, it does not work off tables it works on your own schedule so let's try create one so we, can, we have to give a name. So I'm going to give this uh, name like uh, create end of day report, right? And I'm, I have to give a web URL. Uh, let me give the standard URL for testing here. And uh, so for the purpose of this demo, let's make the end of day report actually every minute report. So all stars means you want to schedule something every minute. So let's do that. You can send some, set some static payload here. So I'm going to just give something like a uh, uh, table name uh, accounts. Any kind of static payload will work and I'm going to create that schedule trigger now. As soon as I have created it, you can see that in the manage page that you have the schedule trigger, you can see, uh, see the metadata of that. And if we come to upcoming events, just next tab, you would see that uh, these are your upcoming uh, upcoming events, which you are scheduled. You can see that it's per minute. So it's 54, 55, 56, 57, and so on. This is paginated because crowns are forever, right? So this you would have this forever. Uh, this UI is kind of, uh, it's very, very much POC. Eventually you will be able to cancel these or pause these or whatnot, and you'll be able to control these much better. And let's see if there are any events being invoked. Yes, so the time we talked, the, the event was actually invoked and you can see similar to event triggers, you can see the request and you can see the response. And you can also go and create say, schedule reminder and and now you can basically give a time here so i'm just going to copy a time window here uh, let's come back the date is in the past so let's put something more in the future i think this should happen there you go so you can see that this is a one-off thing. And if you look at the upcoming events for this, we will only see one, which is at this time. I think this should hit us in about a few seconds. And there you go. You have the scheduled reminder as well. Yep, so that is scheduled triggers up for launch any day now. And this is the public roadmap. Feel free to look at it. Uh, give us feedback on the Discord community channel 
and I'll see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, Tiru. Um, Tanmai will go next, I think. Actually, I, I, can, uh, I can go. Ah, oh, perfect. Go ahead, Alex. All right, so let me share my screen. Hopefully it won't be too noisy, but um, all right, oops. All right, so one of the things that I was kind of thinking about the last time, uh, with the last community call is that um, for a lot of the server changes that we're working on, they're kind of things that maybe aren't always the most obvious uh, and user facing sometimes you know, they'll show up in the change log, but they're otherwise not things that show up in the console or anything like that. Um, and I, I feel like this is actually probably a good opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the, the stuff that goes on under the hood, just to give some people some appreciation for some of the things that we're working on there. So um, this week, I'm gonna talk about something that we internally call the schema cache. So to jump into that, the basic idea is if you have sort of a Hasura instance running and Postgres instance, then when Hasura starts up, it needs to load information from the HTTP catalog schema, which is the Postgres schema that we use to keep track of all of the um, keep track of all of the sort of tracked tables, permissions, relationships, and things like that. And so we load that into an in-memory cache so that we don't have to constantly hit Postgres. So if, for example, someone sends us a GraphQL introspection query, we can just use a response. We can just send them back a response uh, using that in-memory cache. And of course, for other kinds of queries we do, a lot of the time usually have to hit Postgres to some extent to either fetch data or to insert data into the database, but we don't have to reload all of the schema information. We can validate the query against that in-memory cache. Um, so the sort of situation where this becomes complicated is when we have to basically service APIs that actually change the metadata. So if somebody sends us a request to track a new table or add a new permission or add a new relationship, then we need to go and modify that catalog schema. Um, and so sort of naively, what we would then have to do is reload everything from Postgres and rebuild the in-memory cache. But that turns out to be pretty expensive, so we don't want to do that. And so historically, what we've done is we've just sort of generated a diff and applied it to the in-memory cache directly. So for example, if somebody tracks a new table, we'll create a new table in memory and put that into the cache instead. Um, there's some problems with this, though. So the first of which is that as, you know, when we started out, the stuff that we were storing in that cache was pretty simple. And so generating those patches was not very hard, but over time it's gotten sort of increasingly more difficult. And so now it's gotten to the point where it, it, it ends up being just a lot of work to generate those patches and get them correct. Um, sometimes it's actually not even really practical to do that for certain kinds of features that we're adding that kind of touch lots of different uh, entities in the system. So the sort of first example that we came into or ran into with that was uh, we had the new enum table feature relatively recent and, and that can sort of change when you mark a table as an enum that can change the type of a column in a totally different table. So that's complicated. And then also when you uh, make a change, we actually currently don't even do this strategy on other Azure instances. So if you're running multiple instances in parallel, then you still have to do the full reload for all of those other instances. So um, what I've been thinking recently and what I was thinking about a month ago is this is sort of, you know, really what we would like to be able to do is just have this one path to load information from the, from the uh, HTTP catalog schema and figure out how to make that really fast. So is there basically a way that we could make this work? And, you know, then we would be able to both improve the performance of these metadata change queries and also just have fewer bugs, which is obviously something that that we want. So the idea that I had was to perform some kind of dependency tracking. So you can think of this in-memory cache as in-memory cache stores all kinds of different information about the Postgres schema. And you can think of it kind of like a build process. So if you have sort of a make file that uh, you know, has a bunch of different dependencies and only rebuilds the, the dependencies that actually changed, then that's sort of a way that we could figure out how to make this, this faster. So for example, if we load in all the information um, into sort of some version one of the schema cache, and then uh, somebody says tracks a new function, then we shouldn't have to sort of do any work to rebuild all the entities that don't actually depend on functions. We should only have to do a minimal amount of work that, to modify the in-memory cache just to add that one function. So, um, okay, this is a great idea, but it turns out that actually making this efficient in practice is a little bit tricky. 
So uh, basically what I've been working on for you know, the past couple of weeks is basically taking that idea and implementing it in a way that can go really fast. So to give you some appreciation for what that looks like, I have this complicated diagram here, but I'll explain what it means. So this is sort of uh, a profile of what it looks like when uh, Hasher starts up and starts running the migrations. And the migrations are a little bit complicated because the way that we handle migrations, um, whether they're sort of our internal migrations or user migrations, we have to sort of rebuild the schema cache many times because they're sort of making these uh, sort of incremental changes to the metadata. And so uh, this is sort of a profile of what that looks like. So on the left-hand side, there's sort of the different kinds of operations um, that we have to run in order to build the schema cache. So there are things like uh, fetching the data from Chris, building permissions, building table information. And then on the right-hand side here, we have a timeline of events, <clears throat> sort of divided up into slices. And each one of these little boxes corresponds to a certain amount of time that was spent in that time slice doing a particular thing. So if you look at like this row, uh, right here, this is the amount of time that we spend actually fetching the information from Postgres and parsing it. And then so the other boxes down below are the amount of time that we spend actually doing processing on it. And so if you zoom out on this, this is sort of where things were about a week ago on this, this branch of mine. And you can see that there's kind of this row across the table here that was taking a whole bunch of time. And I was sort of trying to figure out, well, why is that? This actually corresponds to the building of permissions, of processing permission information. Uh, so it doesn't really make that much sense because it turns out for the most part, most of these migrations, they're not actually doing anything to permissions. So why was this such a problem? So after some debugging, I found out, okay, well, it turns out that most permissions are really simple, but some permissions are kind of complicated and they have these ability to reference tables uh, that are completely unrelated from the, the table that you're defining permissions on. And this is a very useful feature, but it's sort of a problem for our caching system because if our caching system is too coarse grained, that means that basically we would end up needing to rebuild all of the permissions anytime any table changes because any permission could depend on any table. This is obviously uh, <clears throat> much too naive. So the solution was to implement fine grains dependency tracking. And so that's what now uh, I have very recently done. And happily enough, now everything is, is pretty fast. And you can see that, that that bar has pretty much gone away. So this is now something that is working. It's available. I have an open pull request for it. It's not merged. Didn't quite make it into 1.0. Would have liked for it to make it into 1.0, but didn't quite make it into 1.0. But it is uh, almost merged. And because it's a pretty big change, um, I don't know if everybody on this call knows this, but every single pull request that we have open, every single change that we're working on, you can, if you want, try out uh, sort of experimental development builds of those changes. And all you have to do is sort of look in the thread. We have this bot that uh, comments with a, a Docker image tag. And if you could try it out and um, you know, let me know if it works for you, let me know how the performance is, then that would be much appreciated. So that's really all I have to say and take any questions. Thank you, Alexis. So Tanmay is next. Tanmay, are you ready? Yep, yep. Let me share my screen. All right. Um, cool. So I'm going to try not to share. Um, let me see if I can share this. OK, so um, what I'm going to talk about is um, the developer experience for some of the actions work that we've been doing. Um, and this is work that touches upon quite a few pieces, um, the server, the CLI, the console, uh, and I'm just gonna give you a sneak peek of what that experience is looking like. There's still quite a bit of work to do, especially with integrating um, Postgres and PLB functions directly, um, adding, adding support for queries and stuff like that. Um, but the idea here is to give you a brief taste of what this experience will look like um, and then get some feedback and then uh, prep this for merging to master. So, um, what I have here uh, running on uh, my local machine is uh, an empty Hasura um, instance. Um, I have a user table that I'm going to track, right? And this has some data inside it right now, uh, which is just one row. Um, what I want to do is I want to be able to update a user um, and I want to uh, update the email of a particular user. But while I update it, I want to add some custom logic um, so that I can validate the email before 
um, you know, before the update actually happens, right? So this is kind of like this example of being able to modify what a mutation does or being able to add custom business logic. So what I'm going to do, um, and this is kind of what the experience looks like, um, I have Hasura running here. That's my Docker Compose file. Um, what I am also doing is that there is a new build of the CLI that I'm using that is integrated with uh, different kinds of code gen solutions and has some scaffolds. Um, and the scaffolds correspond to different kinds of um, frameworks or different kinds of languages that you can write your business logic in. So the current framework that I'm using is basically Node.js and Zite. Um, and there's some code gen, code gen for Node.js and Zite that happens. So I have Node.js and Zite set in my config.yaml. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, first, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run a log service so that I can see what's happening. And in the log service, you can see that now dev is running. Now dev is something that allows me to build serverless functions and test them locally, um, which is very useful for local testing. And then I can finally deploy that uh, to Zide so that it's completely serverless as well. Um, so I have a bunch of things running locally and I don't have anything right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do Hasura dev uh, actions create uh, and I'm going to derive a mutation. So derive from mutation update users. So update users is a mutation that's automatically generated by Hasura. That's the mutation that I want to kind of derive for my action. Uh, and my action is called update email. So when I do that, I get a little window that pops up similar to a git commit. Uh, and what I can do is I can kind of basically customize the entire mutation type here. Um, which, which I can do if I need to kind of have a complex mutation type. But considering that this is going to be really simple, um, all I want to do is have my own update email, which is going to take a string uh, and a ID, which is an integer, uh, and it's going to return a user. So let me just set that here. Um, and then I don't need anything else. So I'm going to remove all of that and then have a type user uh, and then have the ID here. So um, as soon as I do this, let me hit save. Um, what happens is that I have a update email.js that is auto-generated. Um, and this is auto-generated for the framework or for the environment that I'm using, which uses a scaffold uh, system. And the scaffold system is something that's going to be there on our repo as well, so that we can keep adding more and more scaffolds along with folks who are using different kinds of languages or Node or Go or Zite or Express or Heroku, uh, you know, whatever permutation and combination of language um, and framework and deployment environment you have. So I'm going to take this and move this to um, my uh, now directory. So that's this uh, that directory that I have called service slash API. Um, and as soon as I move it there, let me just take a look at this file that's generated. So it's just an empty stub. Oops. Uh, all right. Okay, cool. Um, so it generates kind of a stub uh, that does um, uh, that that basically has, let me open the stub up for you. So API slash update email.js. Um, and this is a stub that works basically for, um, uh, that basically works with Zite, right? And I can test this locally. So what I'm gonna do is go back to my console. And if I refresh this, and I look at the new mutation, I'll see an update email mutation here. Um, and if I try to do something, right? Um, I'll see that, um, I'll see that this is not returning a valid response from the webhook, which is my uh, update email code. So what I'm going to do is I can update this to do particular things. Um, I have a working version of my resolver here. So if I go to API, I have a working version here that I'm going to uh, copy into the actual version. So let me do that here. And let's take a look at this update email. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I have this serverless handler. What that does is it takes the email, it validates the email, and then it runs a mutation to actually run the update, right? Um, and then um, as soon as I save this, because I'm running now dev, you can see that all of this is kind of hot reloading automatically. And then if I go back here, oops, let me just remove this. Um, I can see that this is an invalid email. So if I go and I change this to ASDF at test.com, um, and let's wait for this to run. Do, 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 do. All right, let me just make sure that I'm running the mutation on the right server here. All right. Um, and so you can see that the email gets updated, right? Um, and I can go back to my data here and see that it's asdf at test.com, right? So 
Um, the idea here is that um, the whole local development experience is sorted um, and you can even see the action running here. What I can also do is that in a mutation response, um, I just have to, I think, if is there somebody not on mute? Um, Manish, I think, is not on mute. Um, it's creating a little bit of noise if people can. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Um, and so um, what I would like to do in this mutation response is I would like to refer to the user object as well, right? Because I want, I want to be able to traverse the graph in the response of the mutation. So what I can do is I can also add relationships and I can do this via the metadata file and the code file directly, but I can also do it with the UI. And what I can do is I can set up a relationship to the user object um, without, you know, without affecting my action code so that I can, so that my business logic just does business logic and doesn't have to care about the GraphQL portions of it. And so when I come back here and I do user, um, and then I can actually traverse the user object, right? Uh, let me set that up here and, right? Um, and so the code that I write, right, is basically only looking at, is only returning the ID, right? After doing whatever work I need to do. Um, and this, the, the GraphQL nest of it, which is basically linking that back to the rest of the data graph is kind of done automatically um, by Hasura because of that relationship as well. Um, the nice thing here is that I can switch between sync and async. So for example, what I can do is I can say, um, I don't want this, this action that I'm running might be a long running action. So I don't want the response to come back synchronously, but I want the response to come back asynchronously. So I can switch that to an async mode. And what the async mode does is it basically generates instead of a mutation with a you know response, what it generates is a mutation subscription pair. So what I can do now is I can do an update email. Um, let me just type an email here, whatever. Yeah. Something random. Um, and then in the response, I get this ID. And you can see that this kind of happens instantly, right? Um, it's not even waiting for the server to respond. And that's because basically Hasura is registering and capturing this as an event and then delivering this event to the underlying serverless function, right? Um, and then I can, what I can do is I can subscribe to the result of that mutation. And this is particularly useful um, if I have long running mutations and stuff like that. Um, and then I can traverse kind of the output here, which will then have the output of, um, you know, what I want to capture. So my subscription. Right, um, and then I can traverse the output here and the rest of the data graph and stuff like that. So um, I can switch between sync and async. Um, and this will work today with, it works with having a serverless endpoint, but this could also be a, a PLV8 endpoint, right? A Postgres function, or it could be anything else really. The nice thing also is that the deployment workflow um, from this local development experience uh, moves, uh, works well with serverless. So I'll just show you what that overall deployment also looks like. Um, what I do is I can go to, um, in my local development right now, I was talking to the um, Hasura service, which is running on localhost 8080. What I'm going to do is when I'm going to deploy this, I'm deploying this to Hasura. So I'm deploying this to, sorry, Heroku. So let me just go to Heroku here and you'll see that I have uh, nothing running on Heroku right now, right? So I don't have any tables, any actions. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch that out. Usually I'll use an environment variable for doing this, but just for a demo, um, I'm going to switch that out. And then what I can do is um, I can just do a now, right? And what that will do is that will deploy my functions, all of my functions uh, to site, right? What I'll do on to deploy the Hasura configuration um, is I'm going to go to the metadata file um, and this is the action URL that was set up, right? And I will change this to uh, the now URL that I'll get, which will be service.mg.now.sh, right? Um, and then that's basically pretty much it. And all I do is I can then apply this migration. So I'll do Hasura metadata apply, and then apply this to um, my Heroku system here. So let's go add that. So now this is kind of running here, and this now function is also deployed. So if I head here, I should see that um, you know I have this update email mutation that's available, um, and then I can run this mutation. Um, and I'll get a response here. And then if I change this, uh, this should be an invalid email and I get an invalid email as a response. So um, so now kind of the whole um, system is managed and deployed for us as well. Heroku is kind of helping us manage Postgres and Hasura 
uh, in a way that you kind of scale automatically, um, especially if you configure auto scale on Heroku. Um, and the business logic is in serverless functions, which is also neat. Um, and that, that unit of function does exactly what it needs to do and nothing else. Um, what is also really useful for adding custom business logic is this notion of having transactions. For example, if I want to place an order as a custom mutation or an action, which might need to uh, you know, fetch from an inventory table, maybe reduce a few, maybe reduce the counter from the inventory thing and then go to some other order tables and add something. And the whole thing needs to happen as a transaction. And so we've um, just added support for, we've just added support for transactions as well. Um, and Rakesh will do a quick demo uh, of transactions to over to you, Rakesh. Hello, hi, uh, I'm Rakesh. Uh, um, I've been working on, let me share my screen. Yeah, so I've been working on uh, uh, enabling transaction, graph, enable transaction, graphical transaction or web, web sockets. So you can look at the draft PR at 3557. So this is like, a, <coughs> excuse me, so this is like a draft protocol, like it's like a brand new protocol with a GraphQL hyphen TX. Uh, and uh, these are, uh, th this is a simple spec. Like you have only three comma, uh, three messages you can send to, uh, via client, uh, WebSocket client. Uh, one is execute, if you want to execute any GraphQL query. One is to about, one is to, uh, other is commit. And these are simple examples of how the message is sent and how the response for the message will be. Uh, yeah, so I'll be demoing uh, now. So yeah, this is my, uh, my terminal. So here I'm going to start this uh, uh, server. Yeah, this is my server. And here I, I'll, I'll be showing the Postgres, real-time Postgres logs. So uh, yeah, this is uh, Postgres logs. And I will open the API console. Uh, let me let me refresh. Oh, fine. I have a test table. It has a bunch of names here. So what I will do is, uh, so this is this Postgres logs here in, in this in this in this in this pane. I am going to connect to my uh, server using the protocol using the graph life and text protocol so this is like simple deplus is simple the cla tool in which the protocol is actually hard coded in that to for the demo purpose and so it has been connected whenever uh, if we connect so by default this will uh, initiate a begin transaction whatever the queries graphical queries you run here via type execute everything will be run in a postgres transaction okay so right yeah now the now the connection has been accepted. Now let me. Uh, I have. Uh, okay, I I I will copy the messages. So yeah. Uh, so I will do a simple query. No, wait. Uh, let me. Yeah, this is. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is a simple query, type is execute and payload, you, you, you have to provide a request ID or else if you, it's optional, if it, oh, sorry, somehow it got, uh, okay, fine. This is POC, like it needs much more improvement. So I'm running this query. So I got the data uh, back. So now, the, now I'm going to try a mutation here. So, uh, okay, fine. This mutation. So this is the, this is my mutation. I'm going to insert into the test table with name. So here I will I will try to insert a new name. Uh, okay. Completely call one. Okay, I got response. Now I am querying the same table again. So I got a community call one here. So if we do the same query on the API console, you will not get that uh, community call one as a data because it's not yet committed. It's still in the tra transaction to make it commit. So I will I will send message with commit, type commit. 
this will get committed and that and the connection will be closed so now i'll try to fetch this thing here i got the community call one so let us try the about 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 case also uh, i will show you see this is uh, let me show you postgres logs this is my logs uh, from here i i started the begin transaction and then bunch of queries and then commit transaction uh, yeah from here to here yeah begin and, and now i will test i will show you how upward works connected now i will i will try to do mutation with different name so wait okay copy so i will do is i will try to insert name committee called to to get inserted now i will try to query the same same table in the same transaction now i got committee called to here which means it's being inserted now i don't want to insert this committee called to so i will i will roll back this entire thing using about transaction it will get about it i will try to query here from the console and committee call is not yet uh, inserted so so why why we need this like uh, we we will ensure that whatever uh, in, in in mutation how many mutation you can run everything is uh, guaranteed to be run a transaction but here or the uh, the trans the transaction over web socket uh, will make user to uh, do some business logic like if you want to insert fetch the data and do something with the data again you want to do something like it will help for you write a, a code for actions like what tamay has said and it will help you in that way so uh, and if you open a connection and if you do bunch of queries let's say i inserted this uh, yeah let me check okay so i inserted community call 3 3 but uh, somehow my uh, wait uh, somehow i closed the connection but if query again that is not being it, uh, updated because on connection close if the transaction is still running we will forcefully abort the transaction so that's how that's a chain so you can test it you, you know, people can test this pr and and you can write your custom cloud web socket clients and test this uh, protocol and any feedback is appreciated you can you can comment on the pr any um, any modification or any uh, uh, any improvements to this protocol or any other feature to uh, support thank you so just to add to that we'll also be adding some boilerplate for um, creating like a small transaction client uh, with web sockets with node js web socket because it's a little bit painful um and and so we'll have some kind of snippets for doing that with different languages as well um it's fairly straightforward but it's just nice to have a little bit of a wrapper and some sample code that you can use to kind of start um start working with transactions very easily right just it'll be just a tiny wrapper on top of web sockets basically like a tiny wrapper on top of fetch almost um and um yeah just to add to gavin's point that's that's um that's actually that's actually exactly one of the use cases that we're we're using going to be using transactions for especially during local development when you want to run tests and you want to run a bunch of mutations uh, and you want to see whether the mutation succeed or fail but you don't actually want to insert that data right uh, and so then you can basically run the whole thing as a transaction and abort it and that makes it really convenient to kind of you know just test out your graphql api see if inserts are working but you don't really have to corrupt the data well not corrupt the data but you don't really have to insert uh, mock data in your database um, so a bunch of use cases like that that will open up uh um just a word of warning though that these transactions are meant to be used um these transactions are meant to be used directly from uh kind of like the back end code that you have running like serverless functions or um uh, or microservices that that are contacting um hasura the nice thing about this are there are two big things here one um, permissions will be enforced when you run transactions as well so if you have 
um, select update insert delete permissions, um, those will still be used when you are running a GraphQL query. So you don't have to redo that logic in your uh, in in the functions that you write. Um, you can still use permissions. Um, and the other thing also is that, especially when you think about like scaling this up and down. Um, one of the big problems with running stuff inside serverless functions and contacting databases is stuff like running transactions because connection pooling is a little bit expensive. And in this case, it's taken care of by Hasura. Uh, and especially with the kind of retry logic and event-driven behavior that Hasura has, when you mix transactions with actions, even if the action fails uh, because of excessive transaction load on the database, it, you can configure retry logic so that it eventually uh, it eventually will succeed. So ephemeral failures uh, and load uh, that load spikes that you have will kind of get handled uh, automatically. And this is kind of the stuff that we have to do that, that you usually have to do when you're running, when you're building web servers that do have transactions. And it's uh, kind of nice that uh, now we can kind of automate a little bit of that away. So um, that's, uh, that was transactions. Uh, and um, I think that's it from our side, like Rakesh said, it'd be great to see comments, uh, and we'll keep you updated on the action stuff that's happening as well. Yeah, oh, thanks. Thank you for everyone. So yeah. Thank you so much for your demo, Tanmay and Rakesh. So it's time for our community demo. Gordon, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Uh, thank you. And uh, Tanmay and Rakesh, I just want to say, wow, that's amazing. Those transactions look uh, fabulous. Um, yeah, I'm very excited for the features on the roadmap. Um, uh, just for a kick off, um, I'm going to be talking about how we deploy our platform onto Amazon Web Services. Um, uh, our platform is called Lineup Ninja, uh, and what we do is help people plan events like uh, conferences and festival uh, and, say, a speaker program for an exhibition. Um, the kind of whizzy interface for the product, and I'm, I'm not going to give you a product pitch here. But this is an event that's being planned, the three days being planned. Um, our kind of USP is uh, looking at when people are available, what resources they need, what tracks, what tracks they want to speak on, and that kind of thing. Um, and what we do in real time is that we're checking whether people are available at a certain time, whether they can make that, and resources and what have you. And as soon as you start dragging something around, we check the whole program to see where uh, something can go. So we can easily move a speaker from somewhere to somewhere else. Um, only, uh, this is all powered by Hasura at the back end, so people working in Teams, all this updates in real time, uh, and it's all like through Hasura subscriptions, and it works uh, really well. Uh, so that's plenty enough of a view of the product. Um, the, um, so when we thought about deploying Hasura, uh, and we've been using Hasura in production for uh, about a year now, uh, we first went live with Alpha 33, um, when we were first thinking about how we might uh, deploy it, we were really looking at what our requirements were at that stage. And really, these are very similar requirements for, for anybody deploying Azure in a production environment. Ultimately, it needs to be highly available. If our platform's not up and running, then you know we're not making any money. Um, it also needs to recover from outage with as minimal intervention as possible. We're a very small team. There's only two of us working full-time on this project. So we can't be spending time babysitting the uh, platform. Um, it all needs to be encrypted in transit and at rest. Um, it's critically important to our clients because we store uh, PII data for events. So like speakers, bios, their profile pictures, email addresses, and all of that needs to be encrypted uh, through in transit and then at rest, i.e. when it's written to disk in the database. Um, it needs to be easy for us to scale for the same reason as uh, as I mentioned before, there is only two of us, so we need to be able to scale that up without us uh, taking uh, too much uh, time. Uh, and uh, yes, as a, this last point, basically the same thing. Uh, time we spend maintaining the platform is time we're not making, uh, we're not delivering value for our uh, customer. So um, my background is uh, in AWS. Uh, and when we were researching this, we were looking at a number of components that they can provide. So this is the, the high level architecture and I'll just run through it. I um, appreciate some of you might not be familiar with Amazon and some of their concepts. So I'll just explain them at extremely high level. Um, Amazon is, uh, delivers their services in different regions. 
Uh, so a region would be somewhere like Frankfurt or London or Paris, uh, and we deploy into Frankfurt. And then within an individual region, they have what they call availability zone. And you can think of availability zone as uh, like a data center. Um, one region contains multiple availability zones. They are geographically dispersed within that region. Um, and Amazon recommends that you deploy your services over multiple availability zones. So if one availability zone has a problem, like there's a problem with the networking into there or power problems, then you have another availability zone in that region for your service to continue. Um, as I mentioned, we wanted to deploy this in a way that was minimum uh, maintenance. Um, and Amazon launched a service uh, a year and a half ago, something like that, uh, called Fargate, uh, which is a way of deploying Docker containers um, into Amazon without having to worry about hosts. So you just say, here's a, file, here's a Docker container I want to run literally like the Hasura image uh, and say, this is some CPU I want to give it, this is how much RAM it needs, and then Amazon makes that happen. Um, as part of that, they will ensure it's always running, they will restart it if it dies, they will ensure it runs across both availability zones, and they register that task with uh, an application load balancer. So the client connects over HTTPS to the load balancer, uh, that then load balances to one of the Fargate tasks, uh, and then that's at the back end, we use uh, Amazon RDS, their relational database service, um, and they offer a, a managed Postgres. Um, and with that, we can just say, we need some Postgres resource, and they provide that, and you can run that in what they call multi-AZ mode. So again, it's deployed across multiple availability zones. At any one time, one is the master and the other is the slave. Uh, and they can be failed over if there is a uh, problem with one of the data centers. Uh, and again, Amazon will manage that failover, they're monitoring it, and if there's a, you know, a problem with the instance, it'll be failed over and uh, restarted. So um, that's really been the, the, it's quite a straightforward architecture. Um, it runs, we just have Hasura running in this VPC. Um, where the rest of our infrastructure runs on uh, Lambda, AWS Lambda, through gate, API Gateway and Step Functions. So we've really been keen to avoid having to manage any uh, traditional servers. Um, touch wood, we've been live on this for a year and we haven't had any unplanned outages. So hopefully I'm not jinxing things there, but it's been uh, super reliable. Um, let's have a quick look at the costs for doing this. It's not cheap. Uh, but it's also not expensive. Um, so the, the load balance at the front end runs to about £22 a month, um, which is quite a lot for a single service, but you can share that with other services if, you, uh, if you're provisioning them. Um, Fargate to run uh, the Hasura instance, we run that in a uh, just a quarter of the CPU and half a gig of RAM, and that um, uh, two tasks, one in each availability zone, that's about $11 a month. And RDS, the Postgres, we run it on a T3, T3 micro, um, which uh, is the, a small instance that supports encryption. Um, and we run that in both availability zones uh, for $26 a month. Um, so it's about $60 a month or thereabouts for you know, a fully resilient HA solution. Uh, and you can't argue with that. Um, I just want to mention we are a member of a program called AWS Activate which is Amazon's uh, support for startups. So if anybody's out there uh, creating a startup, they've got a good idea and they want to get onto Amazon, have a look at the AWS Activate program uh, because they will offer startup support, including uh, credits, which helps cover the cost until you know, your business uh, can afford it. Um, just in terms of how to deploy this, um, I read a blog post a while back when we put this together uh, on how to do this uh, using Terraform. Um, if you're not familiar with Terraform, it's a way, uh, it's a way of um, expressing infrastructure as code. So you can say, this is the Fargate instance, this is the RDS instance, and it will go and configure everything in Amazon for you. Um, so I read a blog post uh, a little while back uh, that was taken by the community and turned into a Terraform module. Uh, the links are there, but uh, just Google Azure Terraform uh, Fargate to get that deployed. Um, the uh, I'm a little. I'm aware we're a little bit over uh, time, so uh, I'll leave it there and ask if there's any questions. 
Gordon, there is one question from Gavin and he's asking, how has your developer experience been using Lambdas? Uh, yeah, great, um, really good. Particularly we found step functions to be uh, really useful for us. Um, cause that, uh, step, with step functions, you can describe a flow, like a workflow. So like when we do say new user sign up, we say, oh, we create that in the identity platform. Then we create it in Azure and then we send them an email. Uh, and that all flows through the step functions. So you get a nice little diagram. Uh, and when it fails, it's really easy to, to pinpoint the specific code that's failed. Uh, and that also imports, uh, um, also provides retry logic. Um, that said, having seen all the cool stuff that's coming with Hasura, then I might have to reconsider some of those uh, choices in the long run, but that's where we are at the moment. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. And last question. Um, have you managed migrations locally and in production? Yes, so the way we approached that was uh, to create the migrations from a script. Because um, we have a model in the application that describes things like a session or an event. Um, and we uh, create the, mig the migration file programmatically from that model. So whenever we make a change, uh, to, let's say add a, new, add a new model, that will create the migrations file. Uh, then we apply that locally in dev. And then when we're deploying into other environments, we have a pipeline that uh, just does a Hasura migrate apply on what's been committed into Git. Uh, and that keeps all the instances up to date. Okay, perfect. So I think we need to come to an end. If anyone has more questions, I'm sure Gordon will be happy to answer them on Discord, right, Gordon? Oh, yes, I'm El Gordino in Discord. So feel free to hit me up in your Discord. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much for this demo, Gordon. I think everybody okay. learned a lot. Um, could you maybe stop sharing your screen? Uh, yes. Uh, there we go. Perfect. So this brings us already to the end of this community call. I want to say thank you, first of all, to everyone from the community who took the time to join us and listen to and watch our demos. Also, thank you so much to all the people in our team who prepared um, these demos. I think everybody learned a lot from it. And finally, again, thank you, Gordon for preparing this presentation and sharing this with us as well. So we want to make our community calls better. So we will be very happy if you could give us some feedback on bits.ly slash community call feedback. So you can give us feedback on this call. And also if you have any wishes for something you want to see in the next calls, please let us know and we will include it in one of the next calls. Also, um, we always like to have community demos like Gordon's today. And if you have something, either if you contributed something to Hasura or um, if you build something cool with Hasura, let us know and we will also have you do a demo in one of our next calls. Um, our next call will be on 29th of January. We are going back to our usual schedule of having the call on the last Wednesday of the month. And you can already sign up on the link that is published here. I will leave this for a while so that you can go on this website if you are interested to register. Otherwise, I want to wish Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to those who celebrate Christmas and hope to see you next month. Bye.